Welcome to the first session of the Not Theory course. Uh, my name is Roger Fenn and I am the host for today. Uh, next Tuesday will be uh, session will be hosted by Lou Kaufman. Uh, I am um, a mathematician, retired from classes, but not from mathematics. So let me tell you what I'm going to talk about today. But before I do that, um, we are only doing this because of the um, coronavirus and uh, sadly it has taken many from us, including one of the great mathematicians, um, John Conway. So uh, I'm just going to load up a picture of John. Here he is in his study. And um, as I say, it wasn't planned to mention his name today, but um, I am doing so because, uh, because of his untimely death. And his name would have come up eventually, although um, he not only worked in knot theory, but he worked in many other areas as well. So what are we talking about? We're talking about <clears throat> knot theory. Well, everybody knows what a knot is. Here's a knot. I hold up a piece of string. A knot, okay. And why? Do we study knots? Well, some people study knots uh, for because they're using rigging on a yacht or something and wanted to see which are the best knots for a certain situation. Um, we're going to study knots mathematically. What is the reason for that? Well, there are two answers. There's the official answer, which says that if you've, um, if you imagine this perhaps as a, a, a string of DNA or a, a molecule, long chain molecule, then if it's knotted, the properties of the underlying material will be greatly changed. Um, that's kind of obvious in a way but it's a, a very new topic and, um, and a lot of work needs to be done in this area. So that's the kind of official answer you would give um, if you're applying for a grant or something uh, to continue studying. The unofficial answer is of course, we study knots because they're there, like, um, like Everest. You want to climb it because it's there. That's, that's what Mallory said. Um, and we're interested in knots. So I'm going to talk about the mathematics of knots. And the first lecture will be fairly elementary. I think understandable by most people. And later talks will obviously be a lot more complicated. Okay, first of all, um, let me point out one of the first people to have investigated knots, and that was Gauss, one of my mathematical heroes. So let's have a picture of Gauss. Um, so he is... There, there's a picture of Gauss, nice hat. Um, he was quite an amazing mathematician and physicist. Um, and one of his investigations was into electromagnetic theory. 
and of course if um, if a copper wire is knotted then the, the electromagnetic field will be distorted in some way and um, maybe will affect the efficiency or otherwise of um, of the electrical component which is attached to it. So this is an area which um, I don't think many people have investigated but uh, it's certainly something to think about. Okay that's Gauss and while we're here let's have a look at Tate. Now Tate um, in the early 20th century or late 19th century, I'm not sure, uh, wanted to investigate knots because there was a theory at the time that atoms um, were kind of vortexes in the uh, ether and maybe knotted. Um, for a while that, of course, that theory was dismissed as bunkum. But uh, who knows? I mean, when you think about string theory, there may be something in it after all. Anyway, what he did was to make a table of knots. So let's have a quick look at this table. These are the number of knots up to seven crossings. The crossings being the bit here where things seem to cross in the projection. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. First of all, um, let's have a look at how we're going to represent knots. So I'm going to switch the light on and hold up a piece of white paper here so you can see. Now, if I hold up my knot, I will get an image onto the paper. I can do this. A shadow, okay? A sort of shadow of the knot, which gives some indication of what it is. Okay, so this is a projection from space onto something linear, uh, planar, okay? So, um, so let's have a look at... Uh, a projection of the trefoil. So go to share again and um, we go to here. Here we are. There's the shadow of the trefoil. Okay. Um, but it could just as easily be a shadow of the unknot. Okay. Because um, um, the unknot, you see, can also give the same shadow as this. So let's see, what do we do um, to indicate that it really is a knot and the trefoil and not the unknot? So let's have a look at this picture here. Now, <clears throat> the shadow now has been converted into what we call a diagram, a knot diagram. And at each crossing, we indicate the part of the arc of the knot, which goes over as obscuring the under part of the knot. So you've got over here and under here, and so on. So that, indication round uh, the three crossings is what I call a glyph and it's an indication of what's going on in space. Now you can argue that hang on we can um, we can undo it. it's got it's got these ends here we've done it up why can't we undo it so we can put a stop to that uh, by Let's have a look, what, see if I can annotate this. Uh, I'm gonna use pencil. So if I go here uh, and I take this end, not very good, 
but you can see what I mean. Let me let me undo that. Um, okay, if I take this end and I can continue it off to infinity on one side and on the other side, continue it off to infinity that side. Okay, so then we have something which is sometimes called a long knot because it's infinitely long. Okay, um, but another thing we can do, let's get rid of that is to join up the ends. Oh, I don't know what it's doing there. Um, this is, um, that's better. You see, I can join up the ends like that, so that can definitely not be undone. Um, and I have now a closed loop in space represented by this diagram and this loop is knotted as opposed to a circle which of course is unknotted. So um, let me <clears throat> see I've got my knot here and I join up the ends like so. And now we can't uh, undo it. Okay. So that's what Tate did when he made his um, his table of knots. Um, so let's go back to that picture again. Um, of the the table. Okay, now these are these. He started to classify knots according to their crossing numbers. You see, so the unknot has no crossings, that's naught. The trefoil has three, and it's the only one with three in the following sense. The crossing number is the smallest number of crossings you can get away with. Whereas the figure eight has four crossings and you can't reduce it any further. When you come to five, there's two types of um, knots with five crossings as the crossing number. So this one is the sink foil or sank foil or something because it's got five crossings and here's another one with five crossings which is a bit like the figure eight with one more twist you see and then there's three with six one two three four five six seven seven with seven crossings and as you go up the number of knots uh, with crossing n explodes okay so it's a huge number um, and it's unlikely that we will ever be able to classify knots just by their crossing number um, it, it's possible that we'll never be able to classify knots it's, they're just too complicated but anyway we we um we don't know anyway uh, so, what um, can we say? Supposing we want to um, distinguish, say, the figure eight knot here from the sink foil. How do we know that the sink foil cannot be twizzled about in space till it becomes the figure eight knot. Well, um, first of all, we need to know uh, how our movements in space can be chopped up into small bits, which are understandable. And these movements in space, which any knot can be reduced to, are called the Reitermeister moves. So 
Let's have a look at the Reidermeister moves. These, oddly enough, were invented by Kurt Reidermeister. And there are three of them. Well, at least to start with. And the first one involves one crossing, which is a little twist like this. And that obviously can be undone. Just pull it tight and it's undone. Uh, and then you can twist it the other way. Okay, so that's, that's R1, <clears> the <throat> first Reitermeister move. Now the second Reitermeister move involves two crossings. Um, so this arc is above this arc and you can pull it away. Okay, so you get two, two parallel um, arcs. Uh, and similarly, you can put it away if it's underneath. Okay. Now, you'll notice that I've oriented these arcs for the R2 move. And there's a reason for that, because they differ. Um, and it's useful to have this differing property, as we'll see in a minute. So in this case, the two arcs are oriented both from left to right. That's the way the arrow goes. But in this one, one is oriented from left to right and the other is oriented from right to left. So they're both R2, they're both uh, R2 uh, Reitermeister 2 moves, but they're different in a way which will become useful later. And then we come to the R3 move that involves three crossings. And it can be interpreted as moving this arc, this one here, the hump, over this crossing here. All right, so you, you move it down to here. So this arc has now moved down to here. But another way of looking at it is to look at this arc, and we could say this arc has been moved under this crossing, right? So you have to think about that, but it's true. And then there's this arc here, intermediate arc, which is moves between this crossing, okay? So that's another interpretation of the R3 move. And you see these three arcs, in order for this to work, there's a top arc, a middle arc, and a bottom arc. And they can move independently. And what you get is the R3 move, the third Reitermeister move. <clears throat> now, up here I've put R0. What is R0? R0 means you can just fiddle around with the diagram as long as you don't change the crossings, but just, or introduce them or get rid of them, just move them about so it's a different picture, okay? And then there's R4 with a question mark. Well, we won't say what R4 is yet. That will come later, not in this talk, but in a subsequent talk. Another thing we should mention while we're here is let's have a look at this slide. Now, since we're orienting our knot, we, we can divide crossings into two kinds. There's the positive crossing and the negative crossing. Now, why is it positive? Well, if you imagine you're on the underneath arc and you go under this crossing here, over crossing or the over arc will induce an orientation as you go under and that orientation is like a screw which you do when you open a bottle of wine okay you just screw it in and that's a positive one on the other hand if you look at a negative crossing when you go underneath the screw goes the opposite direction, and it's what you do if you're using a screwdriver to unscrew a screw. You, know, you 
just it's um it's the opposite of this so there's two two kinds of crossings positive and negative um okay what else have we got to show you down here um right having made those definitions we still haven't found a way say going back to the <clears throat> table of knots whether we can distinguish i don't know say six two from six three um, um and um for this, we need something which is invariant, something which stays the same under the Reitermeister moves. The incident, the Reitermeister moves are all you need to know about distinguishing diagrams of knots. Okay. So we have something called three coloring, which is here. Right, so we're going to color the knot with three colors. And at each crossing, we have two rules. Well, three rules, really. If there are three colors, we say, yes, that's fine. If there is one color, we say, that's OK. But if there are two colors, for instance, this is blue and green, that's not allowed. Okay, So you're not allowed to do that. And then you look at the number of ways the diagram can be colored. For instance, if we take the trefoil, there's basically three arcs and they can all be given different colors. Okay, three different colors. So we can do that in, um, in six ways. Um, we can, uh, or is it nine? Mm, more like nine ways. Anyway. They, the ones which, um, where we have different colors, there's three of them. So that the, what I might call the three coloring number is three. Now, if I take this diagram, I know this, you might not think of this as a knot, but uh, it's worth studying. Uh, some people call it a link. Um, it's, this particular one is called the hot flink. It's got two components. You can imagine it in space. It's just just linked together. That the coloring number, the three coloring number, is zero because you cannot. Um, if you try and color it with three colors, you fall flat on your face. It can't be done because supposing that's black it goes around here. It's still black. But since we're not allowed two colors, this one has to be black as well, which means everything is black. So, so the three coloring number is zero. On the other hand, if we take a pair of unlinked circles, okay, these are linked in some way, you can color this one in black and this one in red, and whatever. And so the free coloring number is six. Those are all the ones with different colors. Now, this is the figure eight knot with four crossings. And you find, you can experiment with this, is that you can't, you can only color it with a single color. And so its three coloring number is zero. And this property of being colored is invariant under the Reitermeister moves, as you can easily, easily check that. So this is, these numbers here are invariants. For the trefoil, it's three. For the figure eight knot, it's naught. So the figure eight knot is not the same as the trefoil knot, because no matter how hard we twist it in space, we cannot get it to be equal to the trefoil. And incidentally, however much we twist the the, um, the trefoil knot, we cannot undo it. It can't be undone because uh, the, its three coloring number is three, whereas for just uh, the unknot, the, um, 
it can't it can't be colored it can only be colored with one color at a time right so that the three coloring number would be naught and here this tells us that this is linked but this is unlinked because the the numbers are different okay right so that's an example of um of an invariant okay which distinguishes say the trefoil from the figure eight knot. Now what about um, other invariants? Well we go back to our table which uh, Tate made. He didn't have any invariants. It was all done by bits of string as best he could. These numbers here are what's called the crossing numbers three, four, five, six, seven, the crossing number is the minimum number of crossings you can get away with in a diagram. So that's a, so that's um, another invariant. Okay, um, quite hard to when you get to lots of crossings. It's very difficult to decide whether the number of crossings is minimal or not. So. Um, so we have that. Well, um, I can now talk about um, different kinds of crossings. So, or different, sorry, uh, I want to talk about different kinds of invariants and that the crossing number is three-dimensional in the sense that uh, it's done in three dimensions, uh, but it's, if you project it onto a diagram, a random knot, you cannot tell what the crossing number is just from that diagram. Um, so if you could tell it, if you could tell an invariant from a diagram, you'd call that a two dimensional invariant. Okay, so. The crossing number is a three-dimensional invariant, whereas the <clears throat> the um, the the three coloring number is two-dimensional because if you take a, a you take a, a knot diagram, you can work out from that diagram whether it can be colored with three colors or not. Okay, here's, now I'm gonna give you an example of another kind of invariant, and that's the unknotting number. So here we have some knots, and the unknotting number is the number of changes you must do to a crossing from converting the overcrossing to an undercrossing in order to unknot it. You can always do this. So uh, for the trefoil knot, the unknotting number is one. And you can see that very clearly. If you take this overcrossing here, this over arc, and you convert it into an undercrossing arc by passing this through the undercrossing arc, you can quickly see that it's uh, unknotted. And the unknotting number for the figure eight knot is also one. Um, for instance, if you turn this undercrossing into an overcrossing, then you can easily see that it's unknotted. On the other hand, for the sink foil, the unknotting number is two. You need to do two crossing changes to get it unknotted. And for these other other knots here. This uh, it's got a three twist knot. This has got a knotting number one. The steeler door knot has got a knotting number one. And so has the six two knot here, uh, which I don't think has a specific name. That looks quite nice, quite uh, interesting pattern. Okay. Um, now we I've got, that's obviously a three-dimensional um, 
invariant. It, if you given an arbitrary diagram, you can't tell it's unknotting number just from the diagram. Um, here's another one. This is the stick number. So we imagine now we make our knot out of bits of stick, straight stick, and see what's the least number of sticks we need to make the knot. <clears throat> Not so easy. For the trefoil, you need six sticks. Okay, so here they are one, two, three, four, five, six. On the other hand, for the figure eight knot, which is here, you need seven sticks, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And of course, proving that you can't make a figure eight knot out of six sticks is tricky, but there is uh, an interesting mathematical formula for the stick number of a knot k is bounded above by this expression here involving c of k which is the crossing number and it's bounded above by this expression involving the crossing number so if you put the crossing number of the um the crossing number i say of the figure eight knot um it is uh, four. Four plus one is five, so it's two and a half times three, so it's seven and a half. And I think this one gives you set, uh, six and a half or seven, I can't remember. Um, but if you do it for the trefoil, which has crossing number three, three plus one is four divided by two, so that's two times three, which is six. And I think this is 25, so it's five plus seven is 12. Half of 12 is six. So actually the stick number of the trefoil is actually six. And we can get it from this, this formula here. Okay, so there's some invariants, simple invariants, but just because they're simple to define doesn't mean to say they're easy to find. Okay, that you can simply define them, but not find them. Now, the next thing we're going to do with a knot is to uh, span it by a surface. So here's one I made earlier. Right. So I've got two square, well, rectangles joined by three twisted arcs. I don't know if you can see that. Now that makes an orientable surface. And if you look at the boundary of this surface, it's actually a trefoil knot. And you can see it's got three crossings in the middle. One where my nose is, uh, and one where my beard is, and one where my hair is, right? Okay, so that's three crossings of the trefoil knot, and it is the boundary of a surface in space, right? Now, <clears throat> You can do that with any knot and you can do it from a diagram. And that was the discovery of another mathematical hero called Seifert. So let's have a look at Seifert so we can see his face. Here he is, Herbert Seifert, a German mathematician and what he did. I will explain his construction now. So let's take a diagram and we've got crossings. We're going to smooth the crossings, get rid of them in the following way. So 
we, this is a positive crossing here. Okay, remember the definition of a positive crossing. And we're going to replace it by this, two arcs oriented in the same direction and a thick bridge joining them and labeled by a plus sign because this is a positive crossing. And we can do the same thing with negative crossings. We get two parallel arcs joined by a fat red bridge with a minus sign because this is a negative crossing. Okay, so we do that with all the crossings of a diagram and we get rid of them. And we get something which looks like this. Okay, and now we get circles called cipher circles and red bridges which join them. And some of these Circles will be nested. For instance, these three here are all nested and um, they're all oriented in the same way, you see, because once they're joined by a bridge, that imposes the orientation. So this one's oriented anti clockwise, which means that all the nested ones inside are also oriented anti-clockwise. Now we join up to this uh, set of two nested circles and you see we carry over the orientation along the bridge. So this is now oriented clockwise, right? If they're, if they're outside and they're joined by an arc, uh, by a bridge, then they turn from anti-clockwise to clockwise. All right, and so here we have a little one on its own, and that's uh, anti-clockwise because it comes from this clockwise oriented set. And over here we have another um, clockwise set because that comes from this anti-clockwise circle here, right? Notice you cannot have a bridge joining this set to this set directly because that would contradict the, um, the way the bridge was constructed from two parallel arcs. So, and similarly, you can't join this one to this one by um, an arc, uh, by a bridge for the same reason. So we do that. Now, have a look at these nested circles we can think of these as plates, right? Uh, this is a bottom plate, this is a plate on top, and this is a, a, a small saucer on top of the middling plate here. And we can do the same here. And then we can join up these plates, which we can stack them up so they're disjoint in space. We can join them by the bridges. These bridges incidentally have uh, a sign on them, which I haven't put here. It could be plus or it could be minus. We, we replace this bridge by a twisted rectangle. And the twist will be either in the positive direction or the negative direction, according to the sign of the bridge. So let me try and indicate that with this example here. So here we've got two um, anti-clockwise oriented cycles, circles, and one here which is oriented clockwise. This is joined by a positive bridge. This one is joined by a positive bridge and a negative bridge here. So let's have a look. This saucer is in top of this plate. Okay, here it is up here. And here's the plate down here. We join the two this one by a positive twisted uh, rectangle and this one by a negatively twisted rectangle. Okay. And here this is positive. So this bottom plate is joined to this plate by a positively twisted rectangle here. And the result is a surface. Okay. Um, and because of the orientation, this is an orientable surface. 
whose boundary is the original knot. So let, let me go back to my construction again, my one which I did earlier. You see here, we've got the two discs. Uh, they're joined by um, these ribbons or twisted rectangles. And as it goes across the twist, of course, it goes from the underside of the surface to the top side of the surface. Let's say that's the top side with the flowers on and the white side is the underside. And if I turn it over, you can see that that's true of this as well. Then you've got the, the top side here and the underside here. So this surface is two-sided, which means that it is orientable. Okay, so that's good. Having got, um, so this is Seifert's proof. Um, I'm going to pause the record. Okay, so I had to uh, pause there. I've been told that the broadband is going to be disconnected in quarter of an hour, but I think we've got time to finish. Okay, so um, where were we? We were talking about cipher surfaces covering a knot and um, or spanning a knot, and we can immediately make uh, a new invariant, the genus of the knot being the minimum genus of any surface whose boundary is a knot. Re recall that the genus of a surface is the number of handles, uh, at least for orientable surfaces. Okay, so let's have a look to see what else we can do with the Seifert surface. We can actually, as I'm sure we will do later, <coughs> use it to construct covering spaces by cutting along the surface, but that's a more advanced topic. But we can talk about now something um, called a braided diagram or an annular diagram. That means that all the circles or circles are all nested. And of course, they're all oriented in the same direction. <clears throat> in this case, they're anti-clockwise. And this is called an annular or braided diagram. It's a very special kind of diagram. Um, and it braided because it is what's called the closure of a braid, which will come on in a later lecture what that means. Okay, so it's not clear at first that all knots can be braided, all diagrams can be, uh, you know, every knot has a, has a diagram which is braided. Uh, but let's look at something which is perhaps unusual. Here's the figure eight knot, and that's certainly not braided. Um, that diagram, but it is represented by this diagram, which is braided. All the Seifert circles are nested, and depending on the orientation of the figure eight knot, they will either be clockwise or anti-clockwise. Okay. And there will be three of them, and they will be joined by four bridges corresponding to the four crossings. Okay, so we can do that with a figure eight. Can we do it with every, every knot? Yes, we can. And the man to do it is Alexander. And he, um, he is another hero of the knot world. And he proved this theorem. And now I'm going to quickly show you how this can, can be done by looking at this now we have, remember the, remember the two types of Reitermeister two moves. And I've got here two, um, two cycles, parts of two cycles, which are 
oriented oppositely. So one of these is anti-clockwise and this one is clockwise or uh, all the other way around. And they are distinct. They're a pair which are distinct. Now, if there's nothing like this, then the diagram must be braided, okay? So if we can get rid of a pair like this, if there is such a pair, which is oriented in the opposite directions, then there will be a pair which are next to one another. We can't join them by a bridge, but we can join them by some sort of path, which is disjoint from the rest. Right, which means we can do the second kind of Reitermeister two move. Okay, here we go like that. And now we construct the, uh, the Reitermeister graph with the, with the cycles and the bridges. And you'll notice that we've got rid of a pair of cycles which are oriented in the wrong direction. And uh, we do that, we keep doing that until we get rid of all the pairs which are oriented the wrong way. And then the result is a braided diagram. Very simple. Okay, and that's Alexander's theorem. Okay, so I'm going to stop now. Um, and that's the end of the first lecture on knot theory. There will be, this recording will be made available uh, either in the Zoom cloud or on YouTube. And the next talk will be Tuesday. So uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>